any statement, regardless of how profound it may be, if it is repeated often enough, has a tendency in our minds, in the human mind, to become somewhat shop-worn, to lose its edge, perhaps even to become trite and over-rehearsed. Given that reality, it is still compellingly true that the statement I'm about to make is one that should arrest each of us who name the name of Christ. And that statement is simply that Jesus is coming again. Amen. Now, we've heard that over and over again, year in, year out, decade in, decade out. But if that ever was true, it certainly is true now. And we need to add the exclamation point, he is coming again very, very soon. Now, given that reality, there are a number of things that, that attend that reality, that sort of appertain to that reality. And that is, one of the things is that our church is going to go through biblically predicted trauma and drama as we seek to walk the road that leads to glory. We shall be shaken, we shall be tested by things both without and within, by physical things and spiritual things, by theological things, issues that perhaps we felt were settled will be resurfaced and re-agitated um, as we seek to order ourselves and get ourselves ready for the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me welcome you to 3ABN Today Live. My name is C.A. Murray and allow me to thank you please once again for sharing this part of your day with us. We've got two hours to be together and to wrestle with some of these things that the church is facing in these last days. We have brought in, uh, dare I say, an expert, someone who has dedicated his life to the study of the Word of God and uh, has brought forth from that study uh, jewels and pearls that we will try to mine this very night as we wrestle with an issue that is one of the issues that is facing the church uh, in these last days. Over these last several weeks, months, years, we've talked about a number of things, including creation. We saw a number of things happen at the General Conference. Uh, there are a number of things that the church is going to have to wrestle with yet again as we perfect ourselves, as we work on being the kind of people that God wants us to be. My guest is Dr. Ron Dupre. Ron, good to have you here. Good to be here. Thanks. Well, we brought him in to talk about the feasts. We're going to be talking about feast keeping and feast days. And so this is one of those kinds of programs. We're going to talk about theology. It's, it's a theologically based program. Nobody get away from it. So I want you to grab a pen, a pencil, a typewriter, a computer, iPod, iPad, whatever you want to take notes. You will want to take notes on this particular program because this is a phenomena that the church is facing. Now, we want to sort of ease into this by saying a couple of things. One, it is not our intention to deify or demonize anyone. We're not going to lift up our friends and tear down our enemies because that's not what God asks us to do during these last days. He asks us to do everything in love and in a Christ-like spirit. And yet, there are issues that the church must face. When we think that something is error or is a mistake, we need to say that without saying that the people who hold that belief, however passionately, are wrong or bad or evil or malevolent. Um, uh, there are some very good people who have... Uh, some ideas that do not totally line up with the weight of biblical evidence. So we're going to talk about the weight of biblical evidence, not attempting to demonize or, or, or destroy any person or persons, but we're going to just look at the Bible doctrine. I think uh, the good doctor agrees with me on that. Absolutely. We just want to see, what does the Bible say? Now, I need to pay you a compliment, uh, because you've been here before, and whenever you talk about Bible subjects, um, your face kind of lights up. You know, there's this sort of elan, this joy that sort of emanates from your face. You, you really like what you do. Absolutely. I love digging deeply into the written word. It helps me to get to see the living word, yes. Jesus Christ. And yes. of course, he says he came to give us life more abundant. Indeed. I mean, what's there not to smile about? <laughs> what's there not to be joyous about? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, I, admittedly, it steps on our toes. The word does sometimes. Yes, but yes, yes. That helps us to develop character. So Praise we can reflect. God. 
Praise the love God. of Jesus. So this, this night, this is not going to be a sad, morose, dry theological treatise or opus. Not at all. We're going to open up the Word of God and let the light of Christ's love shine from that Word and illuminate our path. And we've got uh, someone who spent a good part of his life studying the Word of God. Were I to give you his degrees, and I, and I will do that. He's a THD, a, a demon working on a PhD. Uh, so he's got, as, as my friends say, more degrees than a thermometer. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, dare I say, he is an African-American. Absolutely. <laughs> he is more African-American than I am, he, having been born in South Africa. That's correct. Holding now dual citizenship, South Africa and the United States of America. Well, well sometimes I tell people three citizenships because uh -huh. the Bible says my real citizenship is in heaven. Is in heaven, amen. So amen. I have amen. these amen. two earthly ones and then, yeah. of course, the real citizenship. <laughs> That's correct. And, of course, the American citizenship through my wife, mm -hmm. who was born and raised in Texas. In Texas, yeah. amen. Yeah. That's to my wife. So you got a couple of African Americans sitting here. We <laughs> praise the Lord, who both owe their 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 allegiance to and citizenship is in in heaven, and that's what uh, what brings us together. And those are the kinds of things we want to deal with and wrestle with this very evening. Before we unpackage his story, and I want to talk to him a little bit about his personal journey because that is one of interest. Also, before we sort of loose him and let him go into tonight's subject, uh, we've got some special music. Uh, Herman and Sonny Harp are. Uh, standing in the wings, as it were, and are, be going to be, and are going to be singing the Wayfaring Stranger medley. I'm just a
Amen. Well done, Herman and Sonny Harp, uh, Wayfaring Stranger Medley. Really well done. Um, Ron and I were talking during the break, just before we, we, we came out, and uh, discovered that we were at the seminary at the same time at Andrews University. That's right. And I suspect sat in some of the same classes and may not have known, really? uh, known that. But uh, in the same years, we won't say precisely what years, no. but <laughs> <laughs> they were indeed the same years. I want just to get a little background before we head into our discussion of the feast. And um, uh, we will give, up, give out some information in just a little bit because I suspect that our discussion will occasion some questions, some comments, some concerns uh, from you. And we'll give out some information so that you can give us some questions. And as time allows in the second half, we'll try to address and redress some of those, those issues that you may have. But we're, we're dealing with an issue that very, very contemporary is one that the church is facing and looking at today and wrestling with just a bit. So we want to give you an opportunity to sort of weigh in on this subject uh, before our night is done. Born in South Africa, Adventist home? Yes, mm -hmm. correct, Adventist home. I tell people, you're never born in Adventist, you're born in Adventist home. Precisely. Became one by choice. And yeah. I thank God for parents who uh, gave me a, a good direction and um, just was fortunate for that. Also had a lot of Seventh Adventist uh, schooling, not all. Mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I studied outside as well, mm -hmm. currently studying at a uh, state university right now under mm -hmm. a Dutch Reformed professor. Uh -huh. So I've had both inside and outside of the, uh, uh -huh. the church structure. Uh -huh. Now you say you became one by choice. About what time in your life did it sort of occur to you you needed one-on-one? -on -one? Slowly or kind of dramatically? Well, make a long story short, when my friends got baptized when they were about 12, I jumped in as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, but never really gave my heart to the Lord then. Mm -hmm. It was about 24, 25 when I really actually accepted and made a personal commitment to mm -hmm. Jesus Christ as a result of an incredible series of events, long story, but uh, that's what I consider my real mm -hmm. commitment to mm -hmm. Jesus. And that ironically happened only after I had finished four years of theology. Uh -huh. I tell people that I was a, a college theology graduate who didn't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And only subsequently did I give my heart yeah. to him and have had a wonderful growing relationship yeah. 30 years yeah. Yeah. more. I think I fall into the same category. You can, you can have a technical working knowledge of the Bible and of, of theological concepts and really not have a working relationship right. with Christ. Was it, was it a, a dramatic incident or just a dawning upon you that you needed a relationship? For me, it was a dramatic incident where mm -hmm. the Lord answered my prayer in a phenomenal way. And it uh -huh. takes a whole half an hour just to tell the story. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the only time I really talked to the Lord was at mealtimes, the mm. short grace. Yes. But this time when I was in the foxhole, as they say, yes, I yes. turned to the Lord and said, I need help. And uh -huh. the Lord just didn't answer the prayer, but overwhelmed me with his grace. Mm. And I knew he was trying to get through to what they sometimes call a gospel hardened person. Yes, yes, so yes, in yes. Church week after week mm -hmm. and, uh, and maybe in the back row and God just overwhelmed me with his answer. He didn't just provide my needs, he provided beyond my wants even. Mm. And when I saw that, I said, okay, Lord, okay, yes, mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. Thank you mm -hmm. for being mm -hmm. so good to now, me. Now, <laughs> forgive me, because the, the reporter in me now is, has turned on. Is uh -oh. this something you can share in a, in a sort of broad context? Because I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah, now, okay, yeah. okay, I'll do it in, in two or three minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and actually, my, my, I was living in South Africa, as, as you probably would know by now. It was my 20s, early 20s, and my mom got very ill. We didn't have telephones, cell phones back then. Mm -hmm. And to make a long story short, when she got ill, and I was a thousand miles, away. I didn't know what had happened. Mm. And, uh, and I didn't have any way to get home. So I turned to God. I said, God, I need to get home urgently mm. because I'm very close to my mom and I want to make sure I can see her before she dies because I didn't know what was happening. Yes. And that's when I ended up hitchhiking um, and I got a ride with my cousin the first one third of the journey and then about 600 miles. Not only did a car stop, it turned out to be a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> now this uh. is back when hitchhiking was quite, quite, yeah. quite safe still, it was a Mercedes-Benz. It was a brand new Mercedes-Benz. Mm. And it was just like, wow, Lord, you answered the prayer incredibly. And then the guy asked me to drive. <laughs> and, you know, how much better? I'm, I'm in my 20s. And not only that, he fed me. And he just stopped and buy whatever you want. I happened to have some cassette tapes of Adventist singers with me. And I popped them in. And I found myself driving myself home in a brand new Mercedes-Benz. Praise God. Listening to Seventh Adventist music. Uh-huh. And that just kind of overwhelmed me. And I got home that evening. I said, okay, Lord, okay. Tomorrow morning, it was just before midnight. Tomorrow morning, I will start to serve you. You're such a good God. Amen. And I will tomorrow morning start spending time in your word. Yes, that was a yes. key turning point. And yes, I began yes. to read the Bible. And God willing, by the end of this year, I would have had the privilege of going through 
his word 30 times praise God in 30 different versions praise God so that's what's praise just God. just yeah. I'm just flooded with yeah. the wonders of God's grace isn't it amazing how God will give you just what you need when you need it to sort of open your eyes and let you know of his love and his care that's for you right praise God praise God God is so you finished your work in South Africa yeah, well, I was uh, just doing secular work, raising money to come to the States to go into school, which mm. is when uh, I didn't meet you, but we were in the mm. seminary at the same time mm -hmm. there. Studied there, went to Korea as a student missionary. Mm -hmm. Linda, who was a student at Union College, Nebraska, she went to Korea, came there a few weeks after I did. I met her there, both student missionaries. Mm -hmm. We ended up getting married and going back to Korea later on as director of language schools. <laughs> and uh, we went to Japan and Guam. And later on, we went to Zimbabwe as missionaries. Uh -huh. And uh, we went to Peru. So we've worked in different countries uh, around yeah. the world as missionaries. And uh, right now in Michigan. That's mm -hmm. where I'm co currently located. Yeah, communication director right now. Communication Michigan conference. Correct. Yeah. Communication director. When did this hunger for biblical knowledge, you, you've got several degrees. You, you are as qualified as any communication director that I know. The THD, I know, is a tough degree to get. They don't give away THDs. And the demon, and finishing up your PhD. When did this hunger for knowledge uh, in the Word of God and understanding come? Where did that come? Where? Oh, probably. And I've never thought about this very much, except that when I started digging into the Word, mm -hmm. after that conversion experience, yes. after that hitchhiking, mm -hmm. I began to read my Bible faithfully. I began to carry little Bibles with me to give away to people. Mm -hmm. Not only did I want to get to know it, I wanted to share it. Mm -hmm. And I would trace it back to the 70s when I was converted. In fact, my first opportunity I had, I turned around and went back down to Cape Town to my, see my best friend, to spend a weekend with him, to tell him what God has done in my life. So wow. I made another 2,000 round, mile round trip just to go and tell him my story. <laughs> and, and the Word became so important. And ever since then, I've seen the need to dig into the Word. Mm -hmm. It fills my soul. It's fascinating. And of course, it lifts up Jesus Christ and yes. it helps me to become a better person mm -hmm. for His glory. Praise God. So I would Praise trace God. it back to that conversion and that desire to be, to know Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you began, was it a desire to have so that you could share or a desire for just personal enrichment that sort of sent you to the Word? I would say personal enrichment. But, yes. but once the personal enrichment, I, I was so filled, I couldn't be yeah. quiet. Got to share right. <laughs> right. Got to go and tell my best buddy. And in fact, I went a thousand miles down back to Cape Town from Johannesburg mm -hmm. and spent an entire weekend with him. We went into the mountains, just my best buddy and I, and we just spent there. And I shared with him my conversion. Wow. Just had to tell him. But yeah. again, the moment you dig into the Word, you've got to share. Yes, yes, yes. And yes, different yes, ones yes. of us share it in different ways. Some mm -hmm. are preachers, some are teachers. Now, I became a teacher, and of course, I've been a pastor mm -hmm. for several years, and, and some people are more quiet. They'll do it in a quiet Bible study. Yes. Some people will share the Word perhaps more through their life, but we all, Christians, are all called upon to be missionaries. Yes, 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 yes. What occasioned or led you into this particular concentration on the feast? Because you, you, you've dealt, delved into a number of things, including Sabbath, we know the work in Colossians, a number of things that you've really hit on. Uh, but this is sort of your current passion. What sort of drove you into that area? What drove me? I'll have to give credit to this very place <laughs> <laughs> because it was here yes. in August of 2007 when I had been invited to come and do a Thursday Night Live presentation. Mm -hmm. I was interviewed by John Loma King, and we dealt with Colossians 2, verse 16. Yes. So I would have to go back a little bit to where that came from, mm -hmm. just in brief, in case people didn't see that presentation. Sure. It started in the year 1989, when I was doing my PhD work at that time at Andrews University, digging into this, uh, the topic of the Sabbath. Mm. Seventh-day Sabbath, and I came across Colossians 2.16, which, of course, in a nutshell, in a summary statement, which says, let no man judge you concerning food and drink, feasts, new moons, and Sabbaths. Yes. These are, and verse 17, these are all a shadow of that, things to come, mm -hmm. the reality, the bodies of Christ, and just summarized briefly uh, the main ideas. And I, I looked at it, and I began to see that within the Seventh-day Adventist church, there was a main idea. But there were some people going in different directions. Yes. And so that caught my attention. I decided to write a paper on it. Mm. 1989, I began, I wrote a paper, 100 pages. Yes. And out of that grew my interest in this topic. And eventually, I applied for a PhD on this. Mm. And I'm busy working on that as we speak, Lord willing, to be done next year, 2011. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, 
3ABN asked me to come and present on Colossians 2.16 what I had been studying. Yes. Now, to make a long story short, eventually Andrews University Press asked and they came and they published this book, and I'm not advertising it, but this is the book that Andrews University did from that study here. Uh -huh. um, so this is AU Press and they, they asked me to write the manuscript for them yeah. so they could share with what I had shared here. Mm -hmm. Of course, if people do want to know, it's called Judging the Sabbath. Judging the Sabbath. And Andrews yeah. University Press did this book for the topic that I presented here at 3 of Yen. Uh -huh. And of course, so they uh, promote the book and uh, it's interesting. But from there, yes. what happened? When the call in and the questions came after the presentation, that second hour, all kinds of questions came and we tried to stay on our topic. However, afterwards, because my name had been up there and my address, I got lots of material. I have some with me here that was sent by Seventh-day Adventists who disagreed because I had tangentially mentioned, if my memory serves me, that not only does this deal with ceremonial Sabbaths, and we'll get into that later on, yes. but also there's the feasts and the new moons, and I suggested that these were all things that pointed to Christ, and because He came, mm -hmm. we don't do them anymore, and so I got lots of material from feast keepers. That's uh -huh. how it got me into this uh -huh. topic. Uh -huh. So you sort of backed into this by, by really a, 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 an obiterdictum kind of statement, just kind of a throwaway statement that was included in a broader context, Correct. and so that sort of sent you careening down this pathway, as it exactly. were. Exactly, and yeah. then uh, I began to uh, get <laughs> CDs and DVDs mm -hmm. and and, and books, material, and uh, eventually I began to study and to read in this, mm -hmm. and then I began to meet feast keepers, yes. some of them directly, some of them on the phone, and of course from there on I was then invited by feast keepers also, mm -hmm. and I en ended up going to a, what we call a feast keeping camp meeting, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. I've met some wonderful feast keepers. Now, the feast keepers, I want to say, those Seventh-day Adventist feast keepers I've met, they are not what we would consider liberal cultural Adventists. Mm -hmm. No, they are committed to the Bible. They're deep students. They want to dig into the Word. They're passionate. They love studying the Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had one wonderful experience out at a feast keeping camp meeting. I was blessed. Mm. It was vibrant music. It was reverent. Mm. It was alive. And uh, it was uh, a kind of an old time camp meeting. Mm -hmm. But it was a wonderful experience in meeting and spending time with them. Yeah. And that's how I got into it. Mm. And I began to study and to dig into research. And I'm still learning. Yes, yes, learning. yes. So, so when we talk, we are not, we're not judging anybody's Christianity. No. We're not no. judging anybody's relationship or love for the Lord. All right. Uh, because um, these people, as, as you have rightly said, are very, they're not fringe. They're not wild. They're not off. Uh, there are people who believe in the Word of God and are, 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 are people who have a very strong passion for their beliefs. Correct. Uh, having, having said that, uh, we need to, to let the weight of biblical evidence stand for itself, All right. which is what we're attempting to do, to do tonight. So let's, let's launch out into, into our subject. Um, give us, if you will, good doctor, some, some background on the feast. Um, uh, and the, the argument in its broadest terms as is being postulated today. Can I, by, in, by, by introducing this, the whole issue, one of the things that caught my attention was the commitment that Seventh Avenue's feast keepers have to it. Uh -huh. And I'm, I cannot say that they all believe exactly the same, but I've seen some things that are kind of consistent in many of the writings or their presentations. Yes. One of which is as follows. They have said, at the end of time, we as Seventh Adventists must keep not only the Seventh day Sabbath that's in the Bible, but also all of the holy days. Uh -huh. The ceremonial, what we sometimes call ceremonial Sabbaths, or the annual Sabbaths. Sabbath, yes. The uh, um, feasts, uh, Pentecost, Passover, these all need to be kept. All of these holy days must be kept. And if you don't keep them, then you will be lost ultimately. Mm -hmm. So the whole issue of salvation is tied in. Mm -hmm. Now they say this is not salvific, however, you will be lost. That makes it de facto salvific. If you don't keep yeah. these things, yeah. these are important, mm -hmm. at least at the end of time. And of course this gets my attention and I start digging into the text. Yes. Why is this so important? And I will admit that as I began to reflect on it, I realized that some of my own explanation and study of the scripture had not been as careful until I got to know feast keepers. They really helped me to be a much more careful and articulate, hopefully, mm -hmm. presenter of the word. Mm -hmm. I used to use terms loosely, the ceremonial law, the mosaic law. But as I talked to the feast keepers, I found that I must be much, much more precise. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so this was, was helpful in my journey, mm -hmm. in understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, I actually had a journey, literally, I was driving from California, 
coming back to Michigan to work in Michigan. Uh -huh. And after having met with the peacekeepers, having spent time with them, many of the thoughts and the questions they raised began to come to mind. And so I drove from California down to Phoenix and from Phoenix all the way back to Michigan alone in the car. Mm -hmm. My wife was already in Michigan. And that, what, two, three thousand mile journey was another journey. And I, since I was alone, a lot of these things were going through my head. Yes, yes, And yes. so I had a double journey. I had a theological journey yes. as I was having a literal journey. <laughs> and so part of what I did is I reflected. And so I'm going to actually ask if we can put up a, our first uh, PowerPoint presentation because there's a slide that briefly shows you the questions I had in my mind. There were five questions that I began to ask myself mm -hmm. and uh, dealing with four basic divine institutions. Uh -huh. Okay, you see I asked the what's the, the when, the why, the how, the for whom, the till when, dealing with the seventh day Sabbath, mm -hmm. sacrifices, circumcision, and sacred seasons. Uh -huh. And that was my journey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As I traveled these thousands of miles, those are the questions I asked. That you wrestled with. Okay, yes, yes, that I wrestled yes. with. Mm -hmm. And I had to uh, jot in a few notes and, and the reason I began to think about this is because I used to just say, oh, this, the ceremonial system, that started with the Israelites. And then somebody said, you know, but what about Adam and Eve? Wasn't mm. there a sacrifice when they sinned? Mm -hmm. hmm. And I began to rethink. Yes. And so as I journeyed, I began to think about this. And this was very helpful. Uh -huh. Five questions, right? Seventh-day Sabbath. When was that established? Mm -hmm. At creation. Mm. Uh, why? As a memorial, very yes. clearly, if you study the Bible in context, yes. by whom? God. By God. It's not astronomical. Right. It, the, you know, we have the month and the year and the day, have all astronomical things, but the Sabbath was set aside by divine fiat. Precisely. For whom? Not for the Jews, for no. everybody. And Man. till when? Mm -hmm. And we know it goes all the way through to the, the new earth. Yes. And so I asked those questions. You follow? And that's mm -hmm. what was going through my mind. And then I went to the next one, mm -hmm. and I began to say, what about... Uh, the sacrifices. What about circumcision? And then when I got to sacred seasons, I asked the same five questions. Mm -hmm. So I began to reflect on it, and then I began to dig into the Bible to see if I could find answers for these important questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was part of my journey that helped to clarify yes. all of this. Okay. The, the feast days, per se, have, have specific sort of contextual reference. Right. Who and why, and what was God trying to do in their establishment? This is, that's what's so important. I'm going to open my Bible, and if anybody has their Bibles where you are and you're watching, we'll go just to Exodus chapter 20, uh, briefly, chapter 12, sorry. Exodus chapter 12, just a few verses. Now, this is a large study, as you well would imagine, mm -hmm. and I've been spending quite a bit of time digging, learning, researching. But in Exodus chapter 12, we will find there, I'm reading from the New King James Version, Exodus chapter 12, verse 25 through 27. Just those three verses. Maybe you can re you read it. I've got the New King James. What are you reading from? I'm reading from what did I bring with me today. This is the King James. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those three verses. Exodus 12, 12, 25 through 27. And I'm at 25. And it shall come to pass, when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass, I'm in verse 26, right. when your children shall say unto you, what mean ye by this service, in 27, that ye shall say, it is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed uh, the head and worshipped. Right, and so you see, when I came across that, that's when it started. I realized, aha, this is what God is telling uh, through Moses, to tell the children of Israel the Passover started there. Yeah. Very interesting. So I began to trace when it started, why it was there. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was instituted by God yes. through Moses. Mm -hmm. Who was it for? And those are the questions I had to ask. It's very interesting. And if you study it very carefully, mm -hmm. it became more and more clear that these were for Israelites. Incidentally, the Passover was not to be celebrated by anybody unless they had been circumcised. Uh -huh. Now, uh -huh. it was the Israelites, obviously, mm -hmm. and uh, the, we know the Ishmaelites also, uh, circumcision started with Abraham and Ishmael, and anybody else who wanted to participate had to be circumcised. Yes. So there's a restriction. And, of course, as you study further, you find it that all males had to go to the central temple in Jerusalem for the Passover, unleavened bread, yes, for yes. The Pentecost, for tabernacles. So it was also a location-centered one. Mm -hmm. So as I began to study, it became more and more clear the sacred season set up by God for the Israelites mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when they came out of Egypt. Yes. 
And so this became part of, oh, okay. And so when, then a question goes, until when does this go? So yeah. all of those questions came to mind as I began to delve. Indeed, indeed. There's a term you used a couple of times uh, in the last several moments, sacred seasons. Yes. Define that term for me. If you the, the word, the term sacred season, I haven't found a better term myself. <laughs> I'm open to one. Different people use different language mm -hmm. for, and the reason I use the word sacred season, there is a Hebrew word yes. called moed. Mm -hmm. And the Moed or the Moedim, which is the plural for Moed, mm -hmm. you know, like you have cherubim, it's mm -hmm. plural for cherub. Mm -hmm. You have Moedim, which is plural for Moed. That is an interesting word that appears about 220 times in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a word that sometimes only means feast or sacred season. I don't like to use the word feast because, by the way, the word feast in and of itself is a joyous occasion. Yes. There is a separate specific word for feast in the Hebrew language uh, deal, when it deals with the uh, sacrificial system and so forth. It's the word chag, ah. very much like the word hajj. hajj. The, the Muslims go on a hajj, hajj to Mecca, a uh -huh. and this is the same type of thing. Yes. It's a pilgrimage feast. Uh -huh. It's a hajj. Mm -hmm. It's like the Aramaic is close to the Hebrew. Yes. So it's a hajj or the chag. And so that's the feast. Mm -hmm. But the word moed is a broader term because it includes not just Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. It also includes trumpets, Day of Trumpets, and Atonement. Uh -huh. and, and, and the five, and of course the others are included in there, yes. first fruits and so forth. But these five, unleavened bread, but these are not called feasts. Actually, technically in the Bible, the f trumpets is never called the Feast of Trumpets. Never. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's the Day of Trumpets. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And they didn't have to go up to Jerusalem. It wasn't a pilgrimage feast. Yes, you had several pilgrimages. The other ones you could Correct. Home. And that's yes. why I Very use true. the word yes. sacred seasons yes. mm -hmm. in order to show I'm talking about all of them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the term sacred seasons is, I haven't found a better one. Sometimes in one of the Bibles I have it calls appointed seasons. Mm -hmm. But the word mo'ed most of the time actually simply means the tenth of meeting. The, it's a congregation of meeting. 67% uh -huh. mm -hmm. of time it's translated by the King James translators yes. as simply the tent of meeting. Yes. And even the Jewish Publication Society, they point out that it's a place of meeting, mm -hmm. not a time. Yes. But uh, about 25 Twenty-eight percent of the time, it deals with these moedim, these sacred seasons. Yes, yes. And then dozens of times, the word moed refers to all kinds of other things. The bird knows its appointed season uh -huh. when it should fly south for the winter, mm -hmm. and and it's a general term. Dozens of times, the word moed. So actually, the word moed does not mean sacred season per se. Uh -huh. It has multiple meanings. One of which about a quarter of the time means sacred season or appointed time yes. or set time. That's why I've, I've tried to find a term, and I haven't found a better one other than sacred seasons. Sacred seasons, yes, yes. So I use the word sacred seasons to include all yes, of them, yes. other than the seventh-day Sabbath. Uh -huh. And the reason I use the word sacred season for the Moed, by the way, the word Moed in the Hebrew, Baruch Levin, Jewish scholar, has pointed out in the Jewish Publication Society commentary that the Sabbath is not a feast. Yes. Because you see, Moed is a time that is set annually. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath is never set annually. Yes. A Moed is set by the sighting of the moon. Uh -huh. Sabbath is not set by the sighting of the moon. Uh -huh. And so actually it is incorrect to refer to the seventh-day Sabbath as a feast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Sabbath is other than yeah. these sacred yeah. seasons. You are presupposing my next question. Okay. <laughs> because the, 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 there are some who would say, well, if, if you get a, do away with the feast, then you really have to do away with the Sabbath because they're intimately and intricately connected. And there are, there are some who say, well, the Sabbath is done away with also. How do you sort of wrestle your way or work your way through that? Oh, that's a large question. One of the best ways is, of course, we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And just to remind the folk, uh, go back to Genesis 2, end of chapter 1, verse 31. And then Genesis 2 talks about uh, um, verse 1, Genesis 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Mm -hmm. This is the creation story. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it mm -hmm. because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. We know this is the setting up of the Sabbath. Now, we know there's no direct command given there, mm -hmm. but we know that God set it up. And how do we know for sure it was a command? Because when we get to Exodus in the Ten Commandments, smack yes. bang in the heart. And literally, it is actually, this is a fascinating thing when you study the Hebrew, the Ten Commandments are actually divided up into three sections. Mm -hmm. There are about 60-something words of the first one to three commandments. Then the fourth commandment is about 60-something words. Mm -hmm. And then the last commandments, five through ten, are 60-something words. Yes. So actually, even uh, amount of words, the fourth commandment 
takes about the same amount, one third, smack bang in the middle, yes, and you got yes, a third yes. here and a third there. Yeah, it, it's interesting in Hebrew that the, the, the Ten Commandments in Hebrew are much, much shorter than they are in English. Yes, <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, correct. We use a lot of words to do what they do in very few words. That's right. But, but uh, so you have the, cent the Sabbath right in the middle, and right, right middle, there, yes, yes, in yes, the yes. heart of the Ten Commandments, the seven-day Sabbath, God says, six days you shall work, verse 9. Okay, why? But the seventh day, verse 10, is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And mm -hmm. why? Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Yes. So here God makes sure that people understand mm -hmm. it's part of the creation story. Yes, yes. Now, by the way, some people say, oh, you Seventh-day Adventists, you've come up with this. What's interesting, uh, a scholar, a Lutheran scholar, Dr. Walter Kaiser, I just listened to him a few months ago, he has a book out in which he says all of the Ten Commandments are found in Genesis. Hmm. He's a Lutheran scholar. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to get to Exodus. You can find the Sabbath in Genesis. That's it. Yeah. Dr. Kaiser is right. And we've recognized that. So once you see that the Sabbath, it's part of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when God establishes the Sabbath in Genesis and here in the Ten Commandments, there's no connection between the Sabbath and sacrifices uh -huh. Uh -huh. at all. And in fact, in Genesis, when God created the earth and he created Adam and Eve, there were no sacrifices because there was no sin. Right, right. So that's the first thing that differentiates the seventh day Sabbath from these feast days that were set up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Completely different. Now, well, let's go to Leviticus 23, uh -huh. and you'll see in Leviticus the importance of sacrifices attached. Leviticus 23, and uh, we want to go to a verse there, verse 37. Leviticus 23, verse 37. Now, when you read it at first, uh, why don't you read for, I'll catch my breath here, you read verse 37 and you won't immediately notice in the English, but I want to point something out to you and we'll dig deeper and we'll see how the feasts are different, these sacred seasons. All right, we're in Leviticus 23, 37. These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering, and a meat offering, a sacrifice, and drink offerings, everything upon his day. Right. Now, right in the middle of the verse, there's a little two-letter word, a preposition, the word to. And you read it there. These are the feasts to be holy convocations to offer. Mm -hmm. The word to offer, for offering, the NIV puts it that way, mm -hmm. okay? And the ESV, the English Standard Version, for. Uh, it points out, it's the idea of... Um, uh, this is the NIV and the ESV for bringing offerings. Yes. Now that's interesting because when you go back to the Hebrew, there's the word to there in Hebrew, that's the word l. Mm -hmm. It's a preposition tied in with an infinitive. Now I know it's a little grammar here, but. Yeah. And, and you know what it means? To with the infinitive is the purpose. And it's interesting because the New Jerusalem Bible translates it this way. I want you to listen to this. These are Yahweh's solemn festivals to which you will summon the Israelites. The sacred assemblies, notice, for the purpose of offering food burnt. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, once you realize that these sacred seasons were for the purpose yes, of. Yes, yes. Take away the purpose have no sacrifices, right. then what? You have no reason to be there. You have no reason. Right. And yeah. you go to the book of Numbers, chapter 28 and 29, you will notice that virtually everything around the sacred seasons was just the offering of these sacrifices. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so there is an intimate relationship. If you have no sacrifices, you cannot have feasts because sacred seasons, the, the broader term, mm -hmm. including atonement and trumpets, are for yeah. the purpose. Yeah. Now, oh. that's a very subtle point. I want to just hold you there because it's, yeah. it's a good point that that the meeting is for the purpose of sacrifice. Correct. It's not a feast in and of itself. It doesn't exactly. stand alone. Right. We, we come together to do this. That's we right. come together for this purpose. Right. So if you take away the purpose, then the meeting is, is illegitimate. Correct. So to say that feasts, we use that term, stand for themselves, no, they were called for a purpose. Correct. And you have to take that whole sort of ball of wax. You cannot tear it apart. Absolutely. They, yeah. They're intimately intertwined. Precisely. For yeah. me, I sometimes, yeah. do you remember a few years ago, this will date you, the old pressure cookers. Before the days of microwaves, they would take a, a pot that had a special lid that locked. That's a little before my time. Before, oh, oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> but you remember those pressure cookers, right? Yeah, I do. It cooked the beans overnight. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and the beans would get nice and soft. But here's yeah. what I'm saying. If, if somebody comes to you and says, man, do you have a pressure cooker? Yeah. I want to show it to my kids. They, they're in the microwave era. They don't know what we had to do. Yeah. 
you know, um, and, and and then you say to me, I've got a pressure cooker, but I broke the lid. Yes. Now, here's my question. What's a pressure cooker without the lid? It's not a pressure cooker. It's not a pressure cooker. It's a pot. It's a pot. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right. It's lost its purpose. Yes, yes. Unless you have that lid that locks it in, Precisely. It, it cannot work. Yeah. And in the same way, th these two are so intertwined. Yes. Remove the sacrifices, mm -hmm. and there is no feast. In fact, when you study them more carefully, Beautiful it becomes pot. fascinating. All of the feast days, all of these sacred seasons, and I'm using the word feast interchangeably with sacred seasons, but yes, the more correct yes. term is sacred seasons, okay? Because the Day of Atonement was not a feast day. It mm -hmm. wasn't a joy celebration. It was a flick your souls on that day. Yes, okay. yes, very but much so. So many of us use the terms interchangeably. Mm -hmm. But all of these sacred seasons, you will notice every one of them, other than the Day of Atonement, only the Day of Atonement, no work must be done. Mm -hmm. The other sacred seasons... You can do no ordinary work, no yes. servile work, uh -huh, uh -huh. no hard work. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you were busy sacrificing. Yes, yes, yes. See? Whereas on the Day of Atonement, no work whatsoever. Whatsoever, sure, sure. So, sure. however, the point is when these are so intimately intertwined and the, f the sacrifices, when did they start? They actually started after Adam and Eve sinned. We know that when God clothed them yes. with a skin and then Abel and Cain have sacrifices, mm -hmm. this all starts after sin. Yes. Yeah. And so you realize that feast days, sacrifices, they came about because of sin. Because of sin. And yeah. ultimately, who did they point to? Yeah. Aha. <laughs> That's right. So go to John chapter 1, verse 29. Mm -hmm. So here's what I want to make sure we always look at. All of these things, the f sacrifices. Now, while, while we're turning, I want your, you may be thinking, boy, these guys are getting into some deep water here. They're wading in kind of deep. Uh, this is theology. I don't know if I can follow them. Let me encourage you. Jump in, the water's fine. Wade yeah. in with us. Stick, <laughs> stick with us on this because this is going to arm you and fortify you. You may know someone that you want to witness to. You may have some questions of your own or someone may have said something to you that you could not answer. So stay with this. Stay on this because this is good information and I, I guarantee you, you will come away from this. This is sort of Feast 101, as it were. We're trying to equip you to show you some of the things that the church is facing and how you, as a child of God, uh, can deal with this and have a reason for the hope that is in you. So if the water is deep, put on your water wings, jump in and swim. The water's fine. We'll hold you up. And uh, the doctor won't let you drown. This All is right. good stuff, so stay with us. Yeah, in fact, I'll say this is like the Dead Sea in the sense that you won't drown, you can, even if you can't swim. You know, there's so much salt in the water. Uh, some years ago, I had the chance to go into the Dead Sea. John chapter 1, verse 29. Here we go. John 1, verse 29 is talking about uh, Jesus and John, uh, the baptizer or the Baptist, as we've called him. Mm -hmm. And John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yes. See, the whole sacrificial system, which are intimately intertwined with these sacred seasons, mm -hmm. all ultimately point to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. There's no question about this as we study the scripture in an integrated whole and looked at it very carefully. Now, mm -hmm. when I say study the scripture, uh, I was hoping we'd have time to encourage people with a good methodology. And maybe there'll be time to bring that in because one of the biggest challenges I've found out with the issue of sacred seasons, feast keepers, is the method of Bible study. Uh -huh. It's picking and choosing a verse here and there mm -hmm. and then piecing it together like a jigsaw puzzle mm -hmm. instead of following a biblical methodology yeah. which then yeah. will be less likely for you to go astray yeah. on these topics. Now this is important because we've been taught as, as, as students of the Bible uh, particularly in the Adventist church that that is how one establishes a doctrinal premise. You never establish a doctrinal premise on one text. You don't pull out one text and say that is the rule for my life. Correct. You find it as it repeats itself throughout the Word of God. So we do have some history of, I don't want to say picking here and there, but certainly finding a doctrinal foundation in many places in the Bible and bringing them together to build our platform. But Correct. you're saying you have to do that in a systematic kind of way. Yes, and right here we're in John chapter 1, right? Uh -huh. Go back two chapters, which means to Luke chapter 23. Um, let's see, Luke 24. No, which is one chapter, actually, just one chapter back. Mm -hmm. uh, this is providential that we're here right now. Uh, John chapter, uh, go back to Luke 24, uh -huh. verse 27. Would you read that? Luke 24, 27. 24, 27. And this, by the way, is, a, I believe, a divine methodology for studying the Scriptures. Yes, yes, yes. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. Who's, who's this talking about? That's Jesus. This is Jesus, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we look at that verse, and I never realized it before, but believe it or not, you know, I can believe this, yeah, 
I lectured for eight hours on that verse. <laughs> okay, I did. I was, do, I was training Bible workers and showing how that one verse, yes. you can unpack it. Mm. Okay, so we're going to try and do this here in about one minute instead of eight <laughs> hours. If you look at that verse, this is Jesus. Where did he begin? At Moses and all the prophets. Now, by the way, first it's Jesus. So all of our Bible in study must be Christ dependent. Yes, very much it's so. very important. This is Jesus doing it. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can't have him walk with us. This is the story of the road to Emmaus. Yes. He doesn't walk with us literally, but he can walk with us spiritually. That's oh, why we have to spend so. our time in our knees before we open the Word. Oh, very true. Okay. Then this is so with Christ dependent. And notice it's chronological, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Yes. And so when I study the whole issue of sacred seasons, feasts, one of the key things we've got to start in Genesis and track it all the way through to Revelation. Uh -huh. And we do find here and there, but we follow a chronological study. And when you do that, mm -hmm. instead of jumping in, let most of my feast keeping friends jump right into the book of Leviticus and extrapolate from there. Uh -huh. And that's a very dangerous methodology mm -hmm. because I can show things in Leviticus that actually Leviticus is not the place to start. You cannot start diving off a 50-foot board yeah. you, before you even know how to swim. True. You know what I mean? You've got to start. Now, if somebody pushes you off, you pray as you go down that the Lord will <laughs> provide. But you're not saying, you don't True, learn yes, to swim yes. that way. And the problem is if you dive in at Leviticus, you get confused. Uh -huh. But if you follow this method, beginning at Moses, so chronological, mm -hmm. and all the prophets, he expounded. That mm -hmm. word expounded is from that Greek word, de hermeneo, from yes. hermeneutics. Yes. He, 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 so he did. It was Christ-dependent, chronological, careful. Yes. He expounded in all the scriptures. It was comprehensive, mm -hmm. all the scriptures. It was canonical, the canon of scripture. Yes. The things concerning, it was contextual. You see that? Yes. Himself. Uh -huh. uh, so we looked at all of them, and that is Christ-centered. And you look at all of these seven beautiful principles, and when you study the Bible in that yeah. way, according to this method of Jesus, yes. the method of the Messiah for searching the scriptures, you begin to unpack it, and then you don't end up as easily with some of these things that are leading people yes, astray. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. Canonical, stay in the Word. That's right. Contextual, let the Word explain itself. Correct. Let it dis define right. how you're going to you, you do your, your, your... Comprehensive. Your, precisely. Right. Yeah, and then stick with Jesus. That's right. And if you follow those things, you, you're going to pretty much land on Correct. your feet. Christ-centered, Christ-dependent. Yes, yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Careful now, study. That's mm -hmm. what we have to do, man. A couple things I need to do before we, we go too much further, because there's a word I want you to get ready to wrestle with, and that's the word perpetual, because oh, it comes up again and right. again and again and again. But we do have a free offer for the evening, and I haven't had a chance to get to it. See, this is good stuff for me. I, I, I love this stuff. I love di digging into the Word of God, and that's why we, we brought you in, because we know you're an excited student of the Word. I can see it in your face. You glow, you smile. You like this stuff. I love it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that is good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Our free offer for the evening is Why the Old Covenant Failed. Why the Old Covenant Failed. It is by the venerable Joe Cruz, who began um, Amazing Facts. Uh, why the Old Covenant Failed. Good little booklet. You can put it in your pocket. Not very, very thick, but packed with information. If you will call us, 618-627-4651, 618-627-4651, or email us at freeoffer at 3abn.org. That's freeoffer at 3abn.org. We will get this right out to you. Now, should you hear anything this night that you want to talk about, add light to, have a question on, uh, want to comment on, Call us again, 618-627-4651, or email us at live, L-I-V-E, L-I-V-E, -E, at 3abn.org, and we will, as time allows, get to those questions in the second half. As we alluded to before, this is a hot topic. This is something that there are many people who are very passionate about. And uh, should you want to sort of weigh in on this discussion, send your questions in, and as time allows, we will get to them in the second half. Uh, good doctor, I did say I was going to toss the word at you. I toss it to you now. We hear about perpetual, and uh, there are those who use this as justification for keeping always. Right. Now, mm -hmm. before we get to perpetual, let me just back up one more thing. Uh -huh. You had asked the difference between the Sabbath and these feasts. Yes. The yes. one is the issue of when it was established, uh -huh. sin, uh, before sin, before the Sabbath. Sin. Mm -hmm. The other one was that sacrifices and uh, these feast days, sacred seasons, are intertwined with, sacri uh, with uh, the feast days and sacrifices are closely intertwined. There's no way to separate them. Yes. Impossible. Mm -hmm. And, and what's interesting that later on, there were sacrifices on every day. There was the morning and the evening sacrifice. Correct. And then on Sabbath, it was essentially doubled. Mm -hmm. So there were special sacrifices on the seventh-day Sabbath. Mm -hmm. But all of these things pointed to Christ. The Sabbath did not. The seventh-day Sabbath points back to creation. Creation, yes, yes. Okay? Yes. Whereas the, the sacred season, the feast days, they point to Jesus mm -hmm. because they're directly and inextricably intertwined mm -hmm. with 
the uh, sacrifices. And by the way, when we get to Daniel, I want to just mention that, and then we'll go to the uh, eternal perpetual idea. Mm -hmm. Daniel chapter 7, uh, chapter 9, verse 27, does talk about Jesus coming. It's a prediction, and evangelical Christians, Bible believers believe this is talking about Jesus. And you notice verse 27 says, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Yes. Bring an end to it. Mm -hmm. So this is predicting that the sacrifices and offerings would end. Yes. And when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we find Paul um, actually identifying that, yes, it did come to an end. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Now, it starts with, therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, yes. since you are truly unleavened. Now, here it is, the, the last part of verse 7. What does it say? Chapter 5, verse 7. Chapter 5, verse 7. Yeah, for, uh, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. That's right. Yes. Christ, our Passover, is yes. sacrificed for us. So these things all point to, to Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, when we study the Bible carefully, we find out that the word Passover, as an example, is used for what you eat. It says, kill the Passover eat the Passover, yes. and then it says, keep the Passover. Yes. It's the feast. In other words, they are, the terms are used interchangeably, mm -hmm. so much so that the eating, the feast, the sacrifice, and the day, there's yes. no difference. Oh, yes. Okay. okay? Understood. Understood. See that? Whereas yeah. sacrifices that, were ha that happened on the Sabbath mm -hmm. are completely separate and distinct from it. Yes, yes, See? Yes. And whereas here, when you go to the Bible, you kill, you eat, and you keep the, the mm -hmm. Passover at the same time. Mm -hmm. They are part and parcel of it. So this is very clear, and therefore 1 Corinthians 5 or 7, Christ fulfilled these things. Very good. Now, very true, good. the question comes up, what do you do with the term perpetual? Now, before oh, you go back, you, oh, okay. you've occasioned a question in oh, my mind. Oh, okay. I, I was moving <laughs> to your next question. So you want to backtrack? Indeed, I want to step back to uh, Does it do violence to your thesis? I, am I hearing you say then that if a person says we must keep the feast, yes. then he has to be saying we must sacrifice or he cannot say the other. Are we going that far? Essentially, absolutely. Yes. Yes, because they are so inter inextricably intertwined, mm -hmm. you cannot have a sacred season, a feast day, yes. unless you have a sacrifice. But think about the implications. I, precisely, yeah, yeah. What are the implications? Yeah. If you're going to go back to sacrificing a lamb, then you, you, have, you have nullified Christ's work in... in, in his work for you. You have You're nullified it. It's not good enough for me. Number one, and yeah. you've actually denied that Jesus is the Messiah Aha. who fulfilled these sacrifices and mm. days that yeah. pointed to him. Yeah. Ultimately, that's what. Now, you might not intend to do it, but yeah. ultimately, that is that's what. That's a statement it, that your um, actions make. That's what your actions make. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's an incredible thought. In fact, there's a book that just came out uh, and, and just last month, in the month of June, and I can read you a statement. Now, this, by the way, went through about 40 different scholars, so it's not just one person's idea. And this is how that ends, that very idea, the question you just raised here, this is how it ends, the, one of the important statements. Therefore, for the Christian to participate in these Jewish celebrations was tantamount to a denial of Jesus' messiahship. Mm. Not just was, but is as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to realize that. And this is, by the way, a fascinating book called Interpreting Scripture. Yes, and it helps yeah, to answer yeah. many of these Bible yeah, questions. Yeah. And uh, so, yes, that's what it ultimately ends up. Yeah. I want to go back because, we, again, to just sort of recap because we're, we're at the close of our first hour. Feast day keeping in and of itself is not an, uh, is not an end. It was a means to an end. Correct. The end was sacrifice. The feast just defined the season or the time that we gather for the sacrifice. Defined it and gave you opportunity to and do gave, that. Precisely. That's so correct. to make feast day the end, keeping the feast in itself, is not, is not legitimate. It's not enough. Correct. Because the, the season was called to sacrifice. Correct. So you got, like, you put one foot down, you got to plant that other foot, which is sacrifice. So a person says keep the feast for in and of themselves only has one foot on the ground uh, in his own argument. Correct. The other foot is sacrifice. Right. They have to go together. And if you're not doing one, you really can't do the Correct. other. And yeah. in addition to that, actually, for three of the feasts, all males had to go to Jerusalem, yes. to the temple. Yeah. And when the temple was destroyed, there was no more place to even go. Mm -hmm. so, so not just was it the time, but also the place. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no biblical justification to have feasts any other place yeah. other than at the temple yeah. for all males. Yeah. It was required. So you can't pick one like a, like a, or another, like a Chinese menu. You've got to take the whole ball of wax because right. it all comes together. Let's go to forever. Let's yes. go to Olam. Yes. Very interesting term, by the way. Uh, as in English, by the way, this is the thing when we go to, in the English language, when I speak to you and I say to you, last year I went to London and da, 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 da. Yeah. If I say that to you, what year am I talking about? If I say last year. The year just before this one. Which is? 
at this Two, point in time. 2009. 2009, yes. where we're talking right now. Yes. But if I had the word the in front of it, the last year I went to London and da 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 da. Could what? be any year in the past. That's right. Correct. Now notice just one word. Yes. When I add the definite article the, it yes. becomes indefinite. Right. Because we understand the language. Yes. See, because we speak English, that's our mother tongue. Mm -hmm. When you get to the Hebrew, you have to understand what these words mean in context. Ah, uh, yes. And that's key to understand. If you want to dig into it, you've got to say, what do these words mean? I've gone and done a complete study of the whole Olam issue. Uh, this is the word for um, uh, this forever mm -hmm. and then there's the word statute which is the word chok masculine or chuka feminine yes and then so my feast giving friends have saying are saying that well there are two kinds there's the statute forever that's eternal and there's a statute that's temporary uh -huh. but actually these statutes the words are used totally interchangeably uh -huh. the masculine and the feminine there's no difference uh -huh. they use them uh, for the same feast you find that in Leviticus chapter 7 verses 34 through 30, 34 and 36 the masculine and feminine language is used interchangeably Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 no difference mm -hmm. So, so whether it's a masculine or a feminine gender for the word statute doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But when the word statute is connected with olam, that is a statute forever, mm -hmm. an eternal statute, you have to say, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Just as much as Samuel was to pl be placed in the temple forever, forever the Bible yes, says. Yes, yes. Okay, you always have to say, what, is the, what does it mean? And it, the Bible with the word forever always indicates it's the nature and the purpose of that institution uh -huh. and until it meets its purpose it uh -huh. is forever, forever. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. and so these are forever statutes until they meet their purpose uh -huh. which is what yeah the Jesus, Christ. Jesus Christ correct right. yeah yeah so they are yeah. forever till yeah. he comes and that's why Paul yeah. can correctly say the Jewish scholar uh -huh. inspired by the Lord Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us yes praise God praise God see very important and perhaps a fitting point upon which to end this particular hour, uh, this discussion of forever and what does forever means. That's a very subtle point. I hope you got that and uh, sort of wrote that down because it, it, it's really a wonderful point and it's, it's in things. a linchpin of, of, right. of the discussion of those who keep the faith. If you say to your wife, I will love you forever. Yes. She doesn't say, liar, you're a <laughs> pastor. She really understands in the context <laughs> yeah. that means until you die. Until I die, correct. Not, not a problem. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah, praise <laughs> God, praise God. You see, good stuff. And I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am because I'm, I'm really, really getting a blessing. And we trust that you are too. Stay with us. We're going to take a little break, take a sip of water. Come on back. We've got much more to talk about. We'll be back in just two minutes. We're back, and my guest is Dr. Ron Dupre, and we've been discussing feasts, feast keeping, feast days. Uh, this is sort of a 101 primer on, on this particular subject. We've, we've hit a number of really, really powerful issues uh, thus far. We want to take just a break and go to our music for the hour. Um, Herman and Sonny Harp uh, were, were so gracious in our first hour to bring us uh, music and return again now with uh, The Day He Wore My Crown. The city was Jerusalem, the time was long ago. The people called him Jesus, the crime was the And I'm the one to blame. I caused all the pain. He gave himself the day.
Amen and amen, the day he wore my crown. Um, sort of fits because we've been talking about Jesus' sacrifice. That's right. And uh, Herman and Sonny Harp, well, well done. We've been talking about the feast, and uh, our discussion has occasioned quite a bit of questions there, and some have come with, with passion. Uh, we know this is a passionate issue for many, many people, and we have been careful to couch our language in redemptive terms. We haven't talked about good or bad uh, or anything like that because we're not trying to... To, to cast any aspersion on people or their belief or question their love for Christ. Simply to look at the weight of biblical evidence and bring that to you and then let evidence be its own judge and its own light. So that's what we're seeking to do. We do want to sort of make a little left turn to deal with one particular question that we have. Uh, the person will not give their name, but they ask, they, they're saying this, Ron. Um, you keep saying the Jewish feast but it's Yahweh's feast, the person uh, is saying. That's the point you're missing because it has nothing to do with Jesus. Mm, interesting. Well, let's go to Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 29. And the reason I use the word Jewish, I should, and I use the word Jewish in the context of ancient Israelite feasts. That's, uh -huh. well, that's the context. I'm not talking about Jews as in today's Jews. I'm, we're talking about, about in the scriptures. Yes. We're talking about biblical Old Testament uh, material. Um, so here we are. Let's go to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 29, um, verse 39. Notice the language here. These you shall present to the Lord at your appointed feasts. 
besides your vowed offerings and your free will offerings as your burnt offerings and your grain offerings and your drink offerings as your, and your peace offerings. Notice, your appointed feasts. Yes. Now, if you go back to chapter 27, verse 2, and if you read that for us, chapter 27, verse 2, who is the your? Mm -hmm. See, and that's the context in which we're talking about. This is where Moses uses that language. Mm -hmm. See, your appointed feasts. 27, 2, and they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the priests of all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation saying... Yes, so this is, this is Moses' name, and this is where they start speaking. Mm -hmm. So it's Moses speaking to whom? Who is the congregation? Yeah, the, the Israel, the, the, the Jews. That's right, uh -huh. the ancient Israelites. So yeah. in that context, that's why mm -hmm. I refer to these as Jewish or ancient Israelite sacred seasons. Yes, yes. So it's not me speaking, it's no. simply that's the way the Bible identifies it. Precisely, you know? precisely. And yes, we have no question that Yahweh did set them up. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. God set them up. If you even think of many things that God did set up, we have this, the issue of circumcision. Did God set it up? Absolutely. Yes. So circumcision is Yahweh's system. Mm -hmm. Do we still practice it? No. no. Because when we get to Acts chapter 15, the, the, the council got together as and they said, we don't need to require circumcision anymore. I see. What, were they throwing out Yahweh? No, they recognized that it had met its fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And therefore, yes, it is Yahweh's. But Yahweh established these sacred seasons for the purpose of these sacrifices to point to Jesus, yes. the Messiah who yes. has come. So actually calling them Israelite feasts, meaning Yahweh's feasts for Israel, mm -hmm. was to point to Jesus Christ himself. Indeed. There's Indeed. nothing wrong in that. It's a biblical concept. It's a biblical term, uh, the idea at least. And so that's why we use the word. And so Israelite feasts, Jewish feasts set up by Yahweh, yes. they've met their fulfillment. Precisely. And God was trying to teach and train and orient their minds. It was Correct. for them, for their education. Now, now by the way, I want to yes. pick up from that because yes. I do. I wish we had another two hours. <laughs> On the other issue, the point you just made, God was trying to teach them. Yes. This is what's so beautiful about that. And, and at the beginning, we should have, I should have mentioned one of the things I wanted to say at the start, and that is there are wonderful, salvific lessons, wonderful, important things we can learn if we study this salvation theme that goes through the feasts. No mm -hmm. question about it. Yes. The sacred seasons, God established them and had Israel learn many important lessons had to do with the, the, you know, the sacrificing, the, the issue of sin and forgiveness and all that, celebrating joyfully and many, many beautiful lessons in these. We are not for a moment tonight saying there's nothing to learn yes, yes. from the sacred seasons that God set up. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're discussing. No. The no. only topic we're talking about, should we be keeping them, yes. observing them. By the way, we're not talking about, there are some individuals who quote unquote mark the season, they don't observe it, but they just say, this is the time that Pentecost used to be mm -hmm. and at home for their kids, they might just say, let's study the Bible and see what ancient Israel used to do at this point in time. Yes, yes, now, if you're yes. living in certain climates, they'll say, the kids might say, but mom, this is too cold to make a trip to Jerusalem. Then you explain to them, well, in ancient Israel, mm -hmm. this is a different climate. It was warm enough for them to go during yes, this time. Yes. But they, you might use the feast, the sacred season for pedagogic purposes to mm -hmm. train. You can learn a lot from it. We're not also talking about perhaps there are some people who might do it as a cultural thing, uh -huh. like Thanksgiving. Yes. You know, yes. I go and visit my in-laws. Uh, I go see people at Thanksgiving. I'm not an American, born and raised. I am now. Yes. But we enjoy Thanksgiving together. Yes. There are some people that might do it as a cultural thing. We're not talking about culture. We're not talking about pedagogy, teaching kids. We're not talking yes. about the wonderful lessons we can learn. The only issue we're looking at should Christians who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, mm -hmm. should Christians be keeping, observing the sacred seasons, the feasts? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking at this evening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the only topic, the only okay. point. So I, I want to make that clear. Yes. I don't want to minimize the wonderful lessons we can learn from studying the Bible on this. Yes, topic. anywhere in the Bible when you pick it up, you can All study, right. you can learn. Right. Shall we keep? Um, in the New Testament, we see this, this idea of new moons, from one new moon to another. Does that in any way push us in the direction of, of feast keeping uh, throughout all eternity even? Oh, you, mean, you mean Isaiah, Old Isaiah, Testament? Right, I'm old, yes, 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 I'm, I'm an Old Testament. Correct. Yes. Yeah, let's go to Isaiah. It's a good question. That's yes. a vital one that you raised because, again, I myself had to go back and study deeply and dig into this Isaiah. In the last chapter, I believe it is. Is that where it is? Isaiah chapter um, 66. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 66, 
And, and we know we often start in 65 and we look at the verse 17 that talks about the new heaven and the new earth. Uh -huh. But we go to chapter 66 and we normally jump to the second last verse. Is that the verse you're talking about? That's the one I meant. Okay. Go ahead and read it for us. And then we'll uh, do, do a little digging on that because that is yes. a verse that's often raised by uh, those who are f interested and passionate about feast keeping. Yes. Isaiah 66 and we're in 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Right. And when you look at that, you say, wait a minute. One new moon. Now, if you stop and you think about it, and by the way, this is where, again, I learned from my feast-keeping friends, and I'm thankful for that. They asked the question, why new moon? If you read it just as it stands in the English, in the New King James, the King James Revised Standard Version, mm -hmm. many versions bring this up from one new moon. What is the purpose of new moons? And again, this helped. I never knew these things until I began to study and dig. Yes. What is the purpose of the new moons? Okay, if you think about it, back then, did they have watches? No. Nothing at all. How do they know when the month begins? Because the way they celebrated and kept their sacred seasons was, you've got to keep this Passover, the 14th day, Unleavened bread, the 15th day of the first month, and yeah. then you get to, you know, the seventh month, you have the first day and the 10th day and the 15th day. How do you know when they are? Yeah. They had people who had to watch to see when they would see the first sliver, the first sliver of the new moon, the crescent. As it came up, they said, ah, that's our first day. Uh -huh. So the, the moon was basically their ancient watch, yes, their watch. calendar mm -hmm. to know when the month begins. Yes. So new moons became pivotal. No new moon. They wouldn't know. And so, by the way, if they didn't see it, they had a way to realize because they, they, by then they knew that the month lasted 29.5 something, 29 and a half days. days right. mm -hmm. And so if they didn't see the moon when they should have, it's cloudy, then they would always have it the next day automatically yeah. uh -huh. because they knew the month couldn't go for more than uh, 30 days. Mm -hmm. So we end up with a Jewish month of 30 days. But, mm -hmm. So the moon was pivotal. That's the first thing. So my feast-keeping friends have brought this to my attention. From one new moon, why would you have new moons in the earth made new unless the new moon was there to identify the keeping of the feast days, the sacred seasons? Uh -huh. Wow, that's a tough question. Mm. And so I began to dig into it and study it, and I, I really my, cannot say I get cr take credit for it, but I did eventually. I was spurred on by another friend of mine who began to do study, and he brought this to it, my attention. And sure enough, what's fascinating, and, and maybe we can put up our second slide I have here. It's just very briefly, the, there's a word there. You'll notice Hebrew, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 23. Yes. There's the Hebrew word chodesh. It yes. appears 283 times in the Old Testament. And now it's interesting. Pr the primary meaning for the word chodesh is month. It's mm. not new moon. Mm -hmm. The primary meaning. And so actually in this construction, it means from month to, to month. month. Yes, yes, yes. Now yes. we'll go to our, to our next slide, our third slide. That immediately pick it up and notice it says Isaiah 66, verse 23 in the LXX. Now that's the scholarly word for the Septuagint. Yes. It was translated. The Septuagint, translated into Greek, the Old Testament, more than 2,000 years ago, renders this word as main. It looks like men with a stroke on the E. Mm -hmm. The normal Greek word for month, the New English translation, the New Living translation say month. In, and the LXX, the Septuagint, says Chodesh of Isaiah 1 is new mania, new moons in context. And, you know, when you look at these things, you realize, wait a minute. Um, going back to the text now, let's go back to this text into Isaiah chapter 20, 66, verse 23. Yes. According to the Jewish translators, by the way, they wanted to translate the Hebrew text into Greek. This was more before Jesus even came along, mm -hmm. before he was born. Okay. And they did that. And when they translated this verse, they didn't say, it shall come to pass from one new moon to another. No, because they realized that Chodesh, 283 times in the Old Testament, its primary meaning is not new moon. Yes. Its primary meaning is month. It's month. Mm -hmm. So in the Septuagint, let me read it to you. Now, I won't read it in Greek. This is the English translation of the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Yes. This is what it says. It shall come to pass from month to month. From month to month. And from Sabbath to Sabbath that all flesh shall come to worship before me in Jerusalem, saith the Lord. Yes. yes. Now, what's interesting, modern translations are picking that up correctly. Mm -hmm. And they therefore translate it now in the New English translation and the New Living translation. They translate from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath. Sabbath. Praise so God. actually mm -hmm. there is no new moon to be celebrated in the new earth. How do we know? If you go to Revelation, Revelation chapter 22. That was the other one that was on the screen, but let's go there to Revelation 22. Now chapter 21 does tell us, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, yes. which is an echo of Isaiah chapter 65. But when we get to Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, is it verse 2 that talks about the month? Yes. 
In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each yielding its fruit, notice, every month. Month, yes, yes, yes. See, that's the month to month. Mm -hmm. And so Isaiah, uh, talking about what we'll do, worshiping month to month, here is the coming together month to month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. The nations, yes. What's fascinating, when you get to the New Testament, 19 times the word main is used, month, and it is translated consistently as month, month, yes. month, month. Only once, once in the entire New Testament is the word neomania, neomania, mm -hmm. new month, new moon. new moon. And the only time it ever appears is in Colossians 2, verse 16. Aha. So only in Colossians 2, 16 is the discussion about new moon yes. uh, festivals. Yes, yes. The rest of the time, it's month. Yeah, and we're going to have to get back to Colossians 2 yes. uh, before we leave yes. uh, so, the subject this but night. But so I'm just saying when you go to Isaiah, yes. Isaiah is not predicting the keeping of feasts in the earth made new. Uh -huh. He's simply saying every month we'll come together and Revelation says, yes, yes we will. Yes. One month by month. Yes, praise God, praise God. Right. Wonderful exposition. Now, Ron, always when you're dealing with this, you have to deal with, uh, in New Testament context, what did the apostles do? What were their, what were their actions? What, what did they do and how does that impact upon feast keeping? So let's look at what, what Paul and the other Right, uh, the, the practice did. of the apostles. Think about this for a moment. Now, you know, you, you, you said jokingly at the beginning, we're both African-Americans, only because I was born in South Africa. And, yes. And I'm an American citizen by marriage. But in your own family, and if you go back for generations, there are certain things all of us do that are part and parcel of us without even realizing it. True. We mm, pick up true. things in our culture. Mm -hmm. And only later on when we bump into some different culture does it, wait a minute, why are they doing something strange? But we are the ones who are doing something strange. You know what I'm talk talking about. Yes. Many times there are cultural things that come with us. If you go back to the ancient Israelites, and you realize, starting back to the, at the time when they left Egypt, and by the way, we know that it started then, these uh, uh, ceremonies, these uh, ancient sacred seasons. Mm -hmm. I want to give you one corroborating text. Go to Hebrews chapter 11 that corroborates when they began. And the reason I want to go there because in my personal devotions, and this is why I want to encourage people to read their Bibles regularly, daily. But one day in my personal devotions, I'm reading through the Bible, a habit my wife and I try to practice every year. And when I got to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20. Eight. It jumped out at me because I was reading a different translation. Now notice what it says. By faith, he. Who's the he? We've got to go back to verse 23. Mm -hmm. Who's the talking about in context? Moses. Moses, you're yep. right. Mm -hmm. By faith, he, Moses, left. Okay, he instituted, sorry. Your, your Bible, my Bible says by faith, he instituted the Passover. And I'm reading this Bible for devotionals and say, wait a minute. It says Moses instituted it. What does your Bible, the King James, say? Kept. He kept. So that caught my attention. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Why does my Bible say he, Moses, instituted the Passover? And the King James Version says he kept the Passover. Now, when you read yours, by faith, Moses kept the Passover. Mm -hmm. A feast keeper who just reads the English will say, aha, he kept it because it had already been instituted from creation. Mm -hmm. And so that caught my attention. And I'm thinking, is my Bible translation correct? And I went and I pulled out my, con my commentaries and my concordances and my Greek and guess what the word is there? It's a Greek word, poieo. Now, the word for keep is teireo. Yes, yes. And it, it's not teireo. It's not there. It's poieo. Poieo means to do, to make. And I went and found a dozen different Bible translations, including this one I brought for this occasion. This is the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which says, by faith, he instituted the Passover. Uh -huh and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, and that's correct translation. And it's in multiple translations, by the way, I've discovered this, the two, today's English version, the revised version. It's many places they correctly mm -hmm. catch the nuance, and not just in English. It's in Afrikaans, another language I speak. It's in uh, German, Veranstalten, uh, uh, and it's also in the modern Hebrew. Uh -huh. the, the, the Jews who believe in Jesus have translated the Bible, the New Testament from Greek into Hebrew. And when they translated it, they even translated it not as Moses kept, but Moses made, Moses made. instituted it. Aha, aha. So there's a wide recognition that Moses did not simply keep the Passover, but he instituted it. Mm -hmm. So this is very important to realize this. So these things all started there. These sacred seasons began back there. Now, so I wanted to make sure that that point comes across. It started there. And that was when? 
we calculate approximately the year 1450 or so BC yes when they came out of Egypt out of Egypt mm -hmm. a round figure 1400s mid uh, 15th century by the time they get to Jesus and he is crucified 30 or so we say 31 how many years had the Jews been celebrating keeping these sacred seasons? Approximately, almost 1,500 years. years. Sure. One and a half millennia. Yes, yes. It was part and par parcel of their entire feeling, their psyche, mm -hmm. number one. So this was just part of their whole culture. Uh -huh. Keep that in mind. Number two, when the Jews and the new Christian sect, as they were called, they were, arose, where did they go to church? Same place, yes. synagogue. Precisely. Okay? Yeah. And so when you think about what calendar did they use? They used the, the same the calendar, right. the only one they had. Yeah. And so all of these things, it was the, 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 the new Christians that came along did not immediately understand or recognize that these things had come to an end. How yeah. do we know? Go with me to the book of Acts. And I'll show you this categorically from Scripture. Now this is kind of fascinating. Remember, generally, the dating of Christ's death is around early 30s. Mm -hmm. We as Seventh-day Adventists believe it's the year 31. When we get to Acts chapter 15, and across the board, Bible-believing uh, conservative scholars believe that Acts 15 happened in the year 49 A.D. And here in, in 49 A.D., they are getting together, the Jerusalem Council, to do what? To discuss what issue? Yes. Notice, this is 18 years after Jesus has already died and gone to heaven. What are they discussing? Yeah. The issue of circumcision. Precisely. What, what do we make Christians do? What, what do right. we allow them to do? And or this force is, them to, actually. What, yeah, well, right. What do we force them to do? That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> a very blunt way to put it, but right. <laughs> what do we force them to do? Now, notice, this is 20 years almost, almost two decades after Jesus dies. Mm -hmm. They're still saying, what should we do with circumcision? Which right. was really the children of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Circumcision was part and parcel of the covenant. Mm -hmm. All males had to be circumcised. They are still struggling with circumcision. Yeah. Now notice, it took them almost 20 years before they realized, and they said, okay, okay, we don't have to require it of the Gentiles. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, it was yes. hard. They didn't. Yeah, because see it was such this. a cultural reality, even more Correct. reality, even more than a religious one. Right. This it is was, how we what we and do. So, so they yeah. didn't give it up right away. Yeah. And so, for one, some of them they 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 didn't realize it. They they just kept doing it because it was part and part parcel of it. They didn't discern what had happened. Sometimes they did it apparently to reach people for the Lord. Mm -hmm. We know that happened in Acts 2 where Peter started preaching to everybody who came together, all the Jews, they were there for Pentecost. Yes. He used it as an opportunity to do what? To reach people for the Lord. And I can show that I believe Acts 20 is a similar example. Paul was going to go to a feast. Why? I believe that Paul was going to go there not to keep the feast necessarily, Acts chapter 20, but most likely to try to reach people. And I'll show you that the uh, reason for that from his own words in a minute. Acts 20 verse 16, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem if possible on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Now, that's when he wanted to reach there. The Bible doesn't say why he wanted to go there, but I believe there's a biblical answer. So go with me to 1 Corinthians. I believe Paul was doing that for a specific reason. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and let's look at what Paul says he did. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. And uh, by the way, I'm going to read specifically now from the New um, Living Translation because it captures it in a, I know it's a bit of a paraphrase, <laughs> but it captures it in modern contemporary English and it yes. doesn't, doesn't twist the Word of God. Mm -hmm. It gets it like we, when we talk about the Bible, we use our own words. Yes. This is putting it in modern language. When I am with the Jews, Paul says, I become one of them so that I can bring them to Christ. Yes. And then he continues, when I am with the Gentiles who do not have the Jewish law, I fit in with them as much as I can. In this way, I gain their confidence and bring them to Christ. Mm. But, he says, but I do not discard the law of God. Mm. I obey the law of Christ. Mm. I love the way the New Living Translation has captured that. Yes. What does Paul say? I, I got involved with the, the custom in order to have the opportunity to win them to Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's, to me, this passage when he goes in Acts chapter 20 to the pen, day of Pentecost, he does not say, I'm on my way to keep the feast. Yes. I've got to be there. What happened at one of the early Pentecost 20 or so years before, 30 years before? 
many people heard the message yes. and they were able to take it out to yes. the world. Yes. And Paul, I believe, is using it. He himself says he does this. He keeps the feast for salvific purposes. To doesn't keep them, but he goes there where they are. Yes, he yes. doesn't himself celebrate them, but he goes there to that. Yeah, because so people are there. That people are there. Yes. That's right. Yes, yes, and yes, sometimes yes. we as Adventists have done the same. Mm -hmm. Easter time, I might get up and preach a sermon on the resurrection of Christ. Yes. Not because we were saying that Jesus was resurrected that weekend, mm -hmm. but because the world or many other Christians are looking at Easter yes. as the way they use the term at the time of Jesus' resurrection. Mm -hmm. And so this is a good opportunity to share yes. the yes. true message. Yes. Paul was doing the same, and 1 Corinthians points that out. Mm -hmm. So they kept it because it was part of their culture, and they had a hard time giving up. They also kept it to reach people for Christ. But you know what? There's also evidence that sometimes they went overboard. Mm -hmm. One time Paul took a vow and he did this and he got into trouble. Acts chapter 18, yes. he made some concessions. And uh, so, so sometimes they actually went a little too far. <laughs> it was part of their culture. They had a hard time giving certain things up. Yes. And by the way, it took them years. We know that to understand that because we know by the end of the 50s, uh, 40s, by the year 49, they were still wrestling with circumcision. Yes. And the customs, that's the word, ethos. And then only around the year 60 only, and that's the best we can date it, uh, Paul wrote the book of Colossians. And by then he understood it. And the Holy Spirit impressed him to write that clear message, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter, I mean, Colossians chapter yeah. 2, yeah. many years after the book of Acts uh, we were talking about here. Yeah. So, well, as we are just about halfway through our second hour, let's, let's wade into Colossians. Okay. Uh, let us do precisely that um, for a number of reasons. Um, one of the things that you dealt with on last you were here and that you deal with, I know, in your book, um, the idea of handwriting on the wall and what that means and what are the implications for uh, continued feast keeping and, and, and what does that mean wonderful passage there in Colossians 2, 13 through 17, actually 13 through 20 if you want to go that right. far. What does that say for, how does that lay on top of what we're discussing this night? Wow. Uh, you know, I wasn't aware of it until I started digging into it, that New Testament scholars consider Colossians chapter 2, those verses around from 13, some go from verse 6 up to verse 19, verse 20. Yeah. That is considered one of the most exegetically difficult passages in the entire Bible to understand. Mm. The most complex. And part of that, and we're not pushing it aside, but part of that is because it's like listening to a one-sided conversation on the telephone. Uh -huh. where you only hear the ones that, yes, no, 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 don't do that. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, go ahead. W uh, tomorrow. No, 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 no. Do it the next day. And if you're only hearing the one side, you're saying, huh, what's bad? What's good? Okay. So in a certain sense, that's what's happening here. However, yeah. however, we know that the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit yes, yes. And, and can be understood in context and digging deeply as for hidden treasure mm -hmm. and following solid biblical principles, we can understand it. So yes. I believe if we do that, I'm not saying because it's difficult, we can't understand it. Because it's difficult, we should set it aside. But, you know, even Peter says some of the things that Paul wrote are hard to hard understand. To understand. He says sure. that yes, this is in the scriptures. Okay. <laughs> this I see as one of those difficult to understand passages. Not mm -hmm. impossible, yeah. difficult, but by God's grace, we can dig into it and understand it. Mm -hmm. So let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Mm -hmm. Actually, there are some scholars that say when you start with verse 6, it gives us some introduction uh, as you therefore have received Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus the Lord so walk in him kind of it starts there mm -hmm. and then it unpacks it from 7 onwards all the way through verse 19 or some go to verse 20 there's a whole section that's together mm -hmm. but we got to start with as you have therefore received Christ the, Paul is talking by inspiration to converted Christians yes he says, you yes. have received Christ you have received him yes you've received him now walk in him in other words, yes. live like real Christians precisely then he continues, and he, in verse 12 and 13, this is key. 12 and 13 is, is considered by some scholars as key for this chapter and key for the whole book, mm -hmm. as kind of the core. You want to read that? Verse 12 and verse 13. And notice the language. Yes. I'm in verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, mm -hmm. wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And now first, stop there. Yeah, right. Now notice buried and yeah, raised. And raised. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, and this is the whole issue of, of, of not just physical burying. This is baptism. That's yes. a symbol of it. Buried and raised. Yes. Okay. And now, now live like you are alive in Christ. Now notice verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Right. Now the old English quickened is of course made alive. Yes. So verse 12 says, you know, you've been buried, okay, 
with, in baptism and you were raised. Verse 13 says, you were dead and are alive. Mm -hmm. Notice, this is kind of an echo in the, in the, in the uh, a very beautiful characteristic of Semitic or Jewish thinking yes. is what they call the echoing ideas. Yes. Sometimes they call it parallelism. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's called uh, chiasms. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh -huh. you've, you've, yes. We've studied those beautiful things. Yes. And yes. you find the repetition. And here is the repetition. You got buried and raised. You've got dead and alive. Mm -hmm. You've got that beautiful parallelism there yes. in 12 and 13. Mm -hmm. And when you look at 12 and 13, you say, wait a minute. If you have 12 being echoed in 13, 14 is an echo of what? It has to be going back to verse 11. And it's very interesting. And in verse 11, it says, In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Now, I know it's going deep into the text. And then verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting. Notice the echo of the hand, hand. Yes, yes. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Now, when they speak, they echo the concept. And verse 11 talks about circumcision, which is part of the ancient... Uh, stuff that was uh, uh, ordinances that were given to the descendants of Abraham. Correct. And, and it echoes verse 14. Mm -hmm. Verse 11 and 14 echo each other. As much as 12 echoes 13, 11 echoes 14. And as you look at that, you say, wait a minute, that is interesting. Now, besides the structure, the way they wrote, let's go into verse 14. Mm -hmm. When it says, having wiped, very interesting. Mm -hmm. That Greek word, excel, um, the actual, actual Hebrew, uh, Greek word there, uh, it comes from a word that is used in ancient literature for wiping out uh, a, a law. It's a very interesting word, exalapsus, to uh -huh. wipe out, abolish a law. Uh -huh. That's what the term is in the ancient secular literature of the time, to wipe out, to abolish a law, mm -hmm. having wiped out. And then it says, having wiped out what? The Handwriting. handwriting. Now that is a word that's been debated now for decades. Actually, it doesn't need to be debated because that word handwriting is a correct translation. Uh -huh. Some Bibles have a certificate of debt and they come up with, that's, yes, not, yes. that's not translation, that's uh -huh. interpretation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If you're going to be faithful, the word there is chairo graphon and chairo, hand, hand grapho. Oh is writing, writing yes, yes. you know, mm -hmm. the graphic, you see, it's a, so hierographon, there's only one way to translate it. Yeah. It is a handwriting or a written code. Mm -hmm. So wiping out the written code, and then it says with its toys dogmasin, with, do, with its decrees, yeah. there's, so it's wiping out, abolishing mm -hmm. the handwritten code with its laws. That's powerful. I've seen this exegeted as sin debt. No, no. Yeah. He's already dealt with that in verse 12 and 13. Precisely. He's done with yes, 12 and 13. Yes, yes, yes. 12 and 13 is dealing with a sin debt. Mm -hmm. 14 is dealing now with something else. Uh -huh. And then it says, and he did what? It, which was something that was contrary to us, against us. And by the way, this echoes Deuteronomy chapter, oh, yes, uh, chapter yes, 31, yeah. verse yeah. 26, where yes. it talks about these laws that were yes, contrary to us. Yes, it does. And it's in the Hebrew mm -hmm. text. Some say it's not there. It is there. Mm. It, these things are contrary to us and having nailed, taken it away and having nailed it to the cross. Yeah. yeah. And so as you look at the echoing, the structure, the linguistics, and you know what, even the ancient Greek fathers, hundreds and uh, almost thousands years ago, over a thousand years ago, they understood this to be what we will call nowadays the ceremonial law. Mm -hmm. I use the word in quotes because the Bible doesn't use the term, but it's the law dealing with the ceremonies, the feast days, all of these things, circumcision, these things. If you're going to look at the text structurally and linguistically yes. and exegetically and intertextually, and intertextually meaning we go back to Ephesians 2 verse 15, yes. we've got the similar phrase there, in uh, dogmasin, the same idea is in decrees, and it's no question it's the Ten Commandments, uh, not the Ten Commandments, but the uh, ordinances besides the Ten Commandments. Yes, so yes. verse 14 is what was nailed to the cross was these additional ceremonial laws. Mm -hmm. Now, I know some people say, but, but, but hold on, hold on, Ron. The word nomos is not in Colossians at all, and mm. that is true. And nomos, by the way, is a word that Paul uses. Many mm. Bible students know the word nomos means law. Yes. It's the equivalent of the Old Testament Torah. Nomos is never used in Colossians. And if Paul was trying to say that, why didn't he use the word nomos? As you look at the context, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Paul didn't use the word nomos because he didn't want people to think that the entire five books of the Bible, the Torah, was wiped out. The Ten Commandments were eternal. The health laws continue, yes. and there are many principles that come from that, like tithing and so forth, mm. that continue. It was only limited to the ceremonial laws, yes, the yes. sacrificial system, the sacrificial days, the sacred days, mm. these that pointed to Jesus. That's powerful. That's powerful. So he didn't use nomos. Yes. He couldn't use nomos. It could confuse people. Yes. So he talked yes. about the, 
the handwriting yes. in decrees yes. that was nailed to the cross. Why? Yes. Because they pointed to the cross, to yes. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Precisely. And that's where they met their fulfillment. Praise the Lord. And in, in Deuteronomy, we get that same word. That which was put in the side of the ark was there as a witness against us. Correct. And here we go with that against us again. Correct. Uh, separate from the Ten Commandments. Right. It was in the side. Right, in a whole other compartment. So two All different right. differentiations. One was against you, and here it is against us. That, was that is what was blotted out. Correct. Yeah. Okay, verse 14, unfortunately, modern translations have not been translating that. Uh -huh. They've been interpreting by saying it's a certificate of death. It's the record of our sins. Yeah. That's not in the text. And guess where they get that? They go to extra-biblical literature, literature outside of the Bible, yes. to prove that. They get it from apocryphal literature. Mm -hmm. When we have the Bible interpret itself, yes. then it has to be the handwriting of coordinates. And we must be faithful scholars of the Bible, have the Bible interpret itself. Mm -hmm. You cannot bring, make the chirograph on, mm -hmm. I believe there's nothing to support the, the certificate of death or the record of our sins. Okay. That's in 12 and 13, not yeah. 14. Yeah. Now, we ease back a little bit into some, something that you touched on the last year you were here. How does this impact or deal with or bring in uh, the Sabbaths that are okay. spoken of in, in, the, in these texts and the texts that follow? Yeah, by the way, verse 14, we just finished. You know, Christ, the, you know, is, is actually, he, he dies, but he is victorious. Verse 15 points it out. Yes. So we'll carry on. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing uh, you know, o over them in it. So Christ dies, he is crucified, these things that pointed forward to him have all ended. He is successful over these principalities, he is triumphant. Yeah. Now, yeah. verse 15, uh, 16. Yeah. Now, that's the text. And I, I just want to say, yes. when I was a young rookie just coming out, uh, a pastor hit me with this. Um, and he said, see, um, let no man judge you. You're judging me because I'm not keeping a Sabbath. And, I've, mm -hmm. and over the years, of course, I've heard this again and again and again. But one of my first evangelistic crusades coming out of school, dealing with a, a Baptist minister, and, and this, he went right to this one. <laughs> right. He went right there. And so it stands out in my mind because it was the first one that I had to sort of defend. And, and it's a tough text. I'll yes. admit that. Yes. When I first started digging into this text, I actually switched my view. I eventually, I, I said, <gasps> this is the Seventh-day Sabbath because I was starting to dig and I hadn't gone deep enough. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the surface, it does look like that. And, yeah. and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, why don't we look at the text right now and then we'll give some background to it. So let no one judge you. You want to read from the King James Version? Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. Yeah, now, now you know, meat is the old English word for food. For food. Uh -huh. uh, it's not, not uh, uh, as in uh, hamburgers or so forth. It's food. <laughs> it's, the, it's a general term. Right, okay? Because you had, you had a, a controversy about meat off, offered to idols and things. In, yes, or yes, all kinds of food. subplot. Right, yeah, right. Food in general. Right. Um, or in drink. Or in respect of an holy day. Mm -hmm. Or of a new moon or of the Sabbath day. And that's what he sort of slapped Correct. me with right out of school. Now, that's yeah. the King James of, of, the, of the holy day. By the way, that's old English, holy day. Yes. The actual Greek word there, heorte, is a festival. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a limited word, by the way. This, unfortunately, uh, almost everybody who, who has given up the Sabbath because they believe this is a, the seven-day Sabbath that I've come across, and all of my feast-giving friends, they have ignored that this word festival is a very narrow word. Mm -hmm. Heorte, in the entire New Testament, categorically I can say, yes. it never includes Day of Trumpets, and it never includes Day of Atonement, and it never includes sabbatical uh, years. Uh -huh. It is a limited word. Heorte actually echoes the Greek, Hebrew word chag, and it's a narrow term that is a pilgrim festival. Uh -huh. It refers to Passover, which includes unleavened bread, first fruits, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Uh -huh. So when it says, let no man judge you concerning, and they use the word festival or holy day in King James, the best word is let no man judge you concerning pilgrimages. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Yes, yes. It, it doesn't Pilgrim include everything. Right. right. You must be specific because you see people say, ah, this is all the annual uh, things. And they say, look, festivals are all annual feasts. There's the argument from outside the, uh, and some inside. Those are feast keepers. They say, festival are all the annual sacrifices, mm -hmm. okay? And once you say, okay, they've got you. Uh -huh. Because if festival is annual, new moon is how often? Monthly. Monthly? Yeah. You've got annual, monthly, yeah. therefore Sabbath must be? Yeah. Annual, monthly, weekly. 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 That's the argument. Yeah, yeah. You see? I see. And, and yeah. you got, you're trapped, but, but actually it's not, it's not a correct argument. It's not even... I wouldn't say a dishonest one, it's a misleading one, unintentionally, yeah. I believe, because the word aorte does not mean annual. Uh -huh. gotcha. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. It means pilgrim festivals only. It includes Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. It never means 
Day of Atonement, Day of Trumpets. So you got to get this fixed in people's minds yeah. very clearly. It's a limited term. I've got a slide I'm going to put up a little bit here, but not yet. Then, so you have, you've got annual pilgrimage festivals, then you've got new moons. Now, what, what's going to happen with Day of Trumpets and Day of Atonement? Yeah. They don't fall under that. They don't that. fall under any of those two. Right. Where do they yeah. fall? Yeah. This is what's fascinating as I dug deeper into scripture because I told you at first I got confused. I also thought, oh, annual, monthly, weekly. Mm. But when I looked at the word, I found that it does not include these others. And then I looked further into the Old Testament and into the Septuagint, the translation of the Hebrew, and I found that, that the Day of Atonement is directly called in the Hebrew a Shabbat. Mm -hmm. And in the Septuagint, it's called a Sabbata, the very word that's here in the Greek yes. for Sabbath. Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. Guess what? The annual, the, sub, the sabbatical years, they are called Shabbat in the Hebrew. They are called Sabbata. I believe they fall under here. Mm. And the, the only one day feast that is not been mentioned so far is what do you do with the Feast of, of the Day of Trumpets? Mm -hmm. It's called a Shabbaton. It's a mini Sabbath. And in some Greek manuscripts, it's also called Sabbata. Same thing. So we have annual pilgrimages, monthly, and then we end up with annual non seventh day Sabbaths. Yes, yes, yes. And, and yes. if you can put up that slide, I want to show that here right now. We can visually see it. And it's very interesting. And then the Greek supports that. So that's where I have it. You see? And by the way, when you look at this whole thing, um, linguistically, semantically, structurally, uh, contextually, everything of Colossians 2.16, we have the annual, that's all, or A, this is the ABA pattern, the yearly Passover Pentecost Tabernacles, yearly pilgrim festivals. Then you have B, the lunar celebrations, and there were 235 lunar celebrations in 19 years. Mm. And uh, because they didn't have 12 months in a year exactly like we have, because it's a lunar year. Yes. Then these are the monthly new moons. And finally, again, you have the A, or A plus, I have here, trumpets, atonement, sabbatical years. These are the yearly plus uh, septennial ceremonial Sabbath. Ah. There's an ABA pattern. It's not annual, monthly, uh, weekly. weekly. It's ABA, yearly, monthly, yearly. yearly. And uh -huh. people say, no, no, Paul wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, he did. We're in Colossians, go with five verses later on. Look at verse 21. Read verse 21 to me. Touch not. Okay, oh, wait a minute. How do you touch with what? Hand. With your hand, okay. Right, touch not. Mm -hmm. What else? Taste not. Taste not, you taste it with your mouth. Yes. Next one. Handle not. Okay, watch. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Yes. What has Paul just done? A. Oh, B. B a. A. Yeah, there yeah. it is. He's got right there. Okay. <laughs> this is a common way, and they believe this is a common phrase. And so that's how they, they did this repeatedly. They had this A, B, A pattern. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Uh -huh. And so Paul is doing the same thing here. Uh -huh. in, and it's not just he is doing it. It, it echoes back to Hosea chapter 2, verse 11. Yes. We have annual pilgrimage feasts. Mm. Then you have new, new ones, the monthly ones, and then you have these annual ceremonial Sabbaths. Yeah, it's God. fascinating as you dig into the language of the text, the structure of the text, mm. it's not annual, monthly, weekly. Yeah. People think they see it because they, do, they don't do a deep study of Scripture. Mm -hmm. They see superficial similarities to other texts mm -hmm. and conclude that. Mm -hmm. Now, the question of don't judge. That, by the way, you have to look in the context again. The book of Colossians, the best we can see is there were similarities to the Judaizers. There were Jewish people who were coming along to the people in Corinth. Most of them were Gentiles in the church, and they were saying to these Gentile Christians, you need to keep uh, uh, these ancient uh, festivals. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, pilgrimage festivals, new moons, and ceremonial Sabbaths. And, uh, and keep these um, offerings as well. And what is Paul saying to the Colossians? Don't let anyone, modern language, yeah pass judgment on you, or as uh, one uh, Bible has put it, let no one pass unfavorable judgment on you. The word krino means mm -hmm. that, passing unfavorable judgment on you, mm -hmm. Colossian Christians, because you are not keeping these things. Ah, I see, I see. See, Paul is writing to the Colossians who are being, with pressure coming on them for, for some, from some kind of Judaizers. Right. Don't right. let anyone judge you mm -hmm. for, on, on these issues of uh, mm -hmm. these things that have now been fulfilled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's the best understanding I've gotten as I've dug deeply to rock bottom. On yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Something popped up in my mind because I, I you know, we talk about shadows of things that come and things that have there. And I, I heard a, a well-known preacher just happened to one, one, one Sunday morning and he was saying that um, uh, 
he was giving as justification for not keeping the Sabbath that that these things were all shadows. Uh -huh. So how do you differentiate between that which is truly a shadow and that which is an eternal precept such as the Ten Commandments? Oh, oh you know, just raising that question opens up a lot of interesting things. Yes. The first thing is shadow, and by the way, hopefully we've settled. If you look at the language, the structure, and the connections, we don't have the Seventh-day Sabbath in the text at all. Yes. We yes. have annual or yearly, monthly, yearly. Mm -hmm. These are ceremonial Sabbaths. Yes. And I was going to touch on that before that question popped in my mind, that when you go annual, monthly, back to annual and not down to weekly, because people imply that that means that's the Sabbath. Correct. But linguistically, it doesn't follow. Cannot. It cannot. It's yeah. impossible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. unfortunately, there's a little unfortunate. Most of us don't read Hebrew and Greek. Mm -hmm. And so we have to rely on translations. Now, you've read the King James. I'm going to read the New King James. I'm going to show you a very important difference, and then we'll go to verse 17, the shadow issue. Mm -hmm. Notice, mine says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival, King James says, and holy day, or a new moon. And the King James says, or the Sabbath days. Right. Now notice, now, the word days, is it in italics? It is. It's in italics. And anybody who knows and reads the, the introduction to the Bible, yeah. when it's italics, it's added by the Attic. translators. Surely. And is the word the in italics? No. Unfortunately, it's not. And you know why? Yeah. Guess what? The word the, I, I looked at the Thomas Newberry edition of the King James Version, and they put the word the in italics. Yes. Because actually the word the is not in any Greek manuscript right. at shouldn't all. Right. It shouldn't be there, right? It shouldn't be there. The is designation for the Sabbath. Correct. Right, right. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. And, and yeah. I did a complete uh, yeah. study when I started digging into this issue, and eventually, that's why I wrote this book, Judging the Sabbath. Yeah. I found that consistently there are 111 times when the word Shabbat is used in the Old Testament. Yes. 111. And of the 111, 85% of the time it's used for the Seventh-day Sabbath. And how do I know? Because every time God impressed the prophet to write with certain words to identify what yeah. he's talking about. Yeah. Because like in English, we use the word trunk. It can mean many things. If I say to you, where's the trunk? You say, which one? The car? The storage? The tree or the elephant, yeah. uh, if you live working at the zoo, all right? <laughs> unless, unless I give you the context, you don't know which one. Precisely, yeah. And so when w the word Shabbat means different things. Mm -hmm. It can be an annual. Uh, Sabbath, like Day of Atonement. Yeah. It can mean weekly Sabbath. It can be the same word for the week, Shabbat, seven days. Mm -hmm. It can also mean, uh, uh, there was one more thing, but anyway, it means different things. Yeah. And how do we know? What I call linguistic links. Yes. Indicators. Yes, yes, yes. Like the last year I went to London, you know, you don't know when it is, but if I say last year when I went to London, yeah. you know it was 2009 mm -hmm. in the context of today. And the same way God had the prophet put linguistic links to identify. And so we know what's Seventh-day Sabbath and what's not. And guess what? Consistently in the Bible, whenever the word the appears, it doesn't always, but when it does, it's seven-day Sabbath. Yes. Whenever the word yom, day, appears with Sabbath, it's seventh day. Yes. And there are multiple linguistic links. Sometimes there are three, four, five around the word to identify. Sometimes there's just one, mm. but it's always clear. Yeah. Now, when it's non-seven-day Sabbath, annual Sabbaths, etc., there are also linguistic links that go with that. Like a Sabbath. Like a Sabbath. Right. Now, although in the Hebrew there's no uh. Right. It's just understood. Mm -hmm. But if they use the word... Um, afflict your uh -huh. soul. You never afflict your soul on the seventh-day Sabbath. That's a day of delight. Yes. That goes with the Sabbath of the Day of Atonement. Atonement sure. So you mm -hmm. know that there are certain words that go with it. And so my analysis, which was eventually published here, and which is now I'm working on my PhD on this, is consistent. The same with the New Testament. It became crystal clear. God never communicated in a confused way. Uh -huh. He's not the author of confusion. Yes, yeah. And so when it's translated, sometimes the translator slips up because yeah. they so make this, And this is one of them. That's one of them. Yeah, this is on That's here. one of yeah. them. Uh -huh. I use the King James. Right now I'm using the New King James. It's my study Bible. Mm -hmm. But here the King James put the word the in and they didn't tell you it is. it should have been italics. Uh -huh. It is not Seventh-day Sabbath. Uh -huh. There's no Greek to support that, the translators forgot to italicize. Uh -huh. And in the Thomas Newberry edition, published around 1890 or so, they put it in italics, re f fixing up what the KJV translators forgot to do. Uh -huh. So it's not Seventh Day. Mm -hmm. So remember, once you recognize that, there's no linguistic links to prove it's Seventh Day. In fact, everything proves it's not Seventh Day. Not seven now you know it's all what we call ceremonial Sabbaths. Mm -hmm. Now, which are a shadow? of things to come. Yes. These ceremonial Sabbaths are shadows pointing forward to whom? Mm. Ah, but the substance is of Christ. Mm. And, and by the way, the Bible will identify, this is important, the Bible identifies what are shadows. And so we know that these ceremonial activities, these pointed to Christ. The seventh day Sabbath is never spoken of as a shadow. Actually never is. No, no. There are 69 words, uh, sabbata or sabbaton in the New Testament. And of them, nine are translated as week. 
correctly. Mm -hmm. And then 59 are translated as seven-day Sabbath with a capital S. This is interesting. The New King James Version, consistent to a T, actually to an S. Okay, <laughs> consistent to an S. Whenever in the New Testament, the New King James translators translated the seven-day Sabbath, looking at the linguistic links, the word day, the word keep, the word the, it's always with a capital S. Yes. When they come to the word that says on the first miaton sabaton, on the first of the sabata, they use the word week. Mm. But when they got, notice when the New King James translators got in the New Testament to the word sabata in Colossians 2.16, guess what? Capital S or lowercase? Lower case. Lower case, yes. Yes, yes and yes. they were right. Yes. The only time in the entire New Testament, mm -hmm. the New King James translates, are they Seventh-day Adventists? Mm, as far as I know, not one Seventh-day Adventist was on this translation committee. Yeah. And it's not just them. When the Holman Christian Standard Bible translators did that, mm -hmm. they did it consistently. The only lowercase s in the entire New Testament is what? Colossians 2, 16. When the New English Bible was translated yes. on the other side of the pond, as they say. Yeah, indeed. Consistent. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I'm saying, wait a minute, how come these translators from different continents yeah. correctly identified this with a small s? Because this is not the seven-day Sabbath. They, the seven. knew. The they knew. The linguistic links forced them to yes. be honest. Yes, 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 yes. It has to be. Now, good we've got to do a couple of things because time yes. has slipped away from us. So, one, one, these are all shadows. Yes. Now, now one thing they say of things to come. But, but you see, the, the writer goes back in time and he speaks from when they were originated. These are shadows of things to come. Mm -hmm. And looking at it from looking that vantage from, point. Yes. How do we know? Yes. Matthew yes. 11, verse 14, and those who are at home, just write it down. Matthew 11, verse 14. Jesus is talking and he says, talking about, this is the Elijah who is to come. Yes. Literally. Yes. And who was he talking about? Talking about Jesus. Jesus was talking about. I'm sorry. It was John. John, yes. that's yes. right. Yes. Yes. Jesus was talking about John. Yeah. Guess what? John was already there. And yet Jesus says, John is the Elijah who is to, to come. come. Yes, yes. What yes. was Je Jesus doing? He was going back in time to the time right. of Malachi, and he was kind of quoting the text. Paul is yeah. doing the same. Yeah. These are shadows of things to come. You now, follow? Elder, I've got to, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited here, but I've got to sort of put a pin in this for a second. We've, we've got to get your contact information out. Okay. And there's one other thing I want to ask you on the other side of that before time gets away from us, and it has flown. Right. Um, should you want to learn more about this or perhaps even have uh, uh, Dr. Dupre come to speak to your group, to talk to you, get a little more light. Here then is the contact information that you will want to have. If you would like to contact Ron Dupre, then you can write to Ron Dupre, Post Office Box 19009, Lansing, Michigan 48901. That's Ron, you spell his last name D-U-P-R-E-E-Z. Post Office Box 19009, Lansing, Michigan 48901. You can call 517-316-1586. That's 517-316-1586. Or email him at faithethics at yahoo.com. It's all one word, faithethics at yahoo.com. Call or write to him today. He'd love to hear from you. good information and do make contact. Elder, we're probably going to end up going out on this, but we cannot really discuss this in total without asking for any spirit of prophecy quotes that weigh in on this. We will probably go in, out on this, but I want to just give you a chance to talk about that, to give us some balance. Yes, uh, yes. we as Seventh-day Adventists have been blessed by this gift, uh, and Ellen White has written some powerful statements. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 365, says, the ceremonial system was made up of symbols pointing to Christ. Yes to his sacrifice and his priesthood. This ritual law with its sacrifices and ordinances was to be performed by the Hebrews until type met and a type in the death of Christ, the Lamb of God yes. that taketh away the sin of the world. Then all the sacrificial offerings were to cease. It is this law that Christ took out of the way, nailing it to his cross, Colossians 2.14. Those are Ellen White's words, mm -hmm. clearly accepting and believing it. And then she goes further. And this is now in the Rebunia Herald, uh, June 14, 19, uh, 1898. These rites and ceremonies no longer possessed any virtue, for type was meeting antitype. The gospel made the rites and ceremonies no longer of any force. To continue these rites would be an insult to wow. Jehovah. Mm. 
Strong words. Indeed. But why would it be an insult to Jehovah? Because the Messiah has come. Yeah. These all pointed to Jesus, the Lamb of God who was slain. He fulfilled these things the best way. If we look at that beautiful picture, Jesus was the Lamb. Yes. He is the priest also. But all of this points to him. And right now he is interceding on your behalf and on Amen. my behalf, Amen. as the book of Hebrews points out so beautifully. Amen. Let me commend to you in closing this book, Judging the Sabbath, a wonderful book that you will want to get. Um, so much that we could talk about, our time has really shot by. This has been an incredible study, uh, one that I am very much invested in and very, very excited about. Uh, study for yourself. The Bible says study to show thyself approved. Always keep your mind and heart open to truth and the Word of God, and you will be where God wants you to be. Our time has indeed slipped into eternity. Allow me in closing now to wish you both grace and peace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye and God bless.